welcome along everyone. So glad that even though it's the last talk, people are still hanging in there over a long kind of three days of NDC and lots of information. So I'm hoping this one's a little bit more fun and interesting. There's no code in it. Um, don't, don't run out, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we sit back and we'll, we'll chill through this one. Uh, so it's my first time at NDC, so speaking and attending, so it's been wow. interesting. <laughs> And, as you can see, we're going to be going into commuting. Woo. So I'm from WA, so Perth, the other side of Australia. 23 kilometres of driving to get here, 3,280 kilometres of flying, give or take, and 9 kilometres of train. But thankfully the speakers are staying here, so my commute to here wasn't so bad. But it took me a little while to get here. And your commute can sometimes feel like it's never going to end, right? Like you're just sitting in this constant flow of traffic. So I think we can all agree commuting is the best part of our day, right? <laughs> all right, well, maybe not. But there's where we live and where we work, and they tend to be separate places. In the middle of that is the commute, right, what we have to do. And I've even spoken to some remote workers after doing this talk, and they too kind of do like mini commutes are here because they want to get out of their house in a bit of a change of environment. So there's even something there for those that are remote workers. Now, according to the 2016 census data, 69% of us Australians choose to drive to work. That means anyone in the car. So you can be a passenger or the driver. And that was true for me as well. I would get up, get ready, go to work and not really think too much about it, do the same thing on the way home. But what happens during that time, right? Have you ever kind of arrived at work and gone, how did I get here, right? I don't particularly remember the journey. I'm pretty sure I didn't break the law on the <laughs> way. But I can't be certain, right? And that sort of summed up my journey. So this is me, Anton Ball, Anton JB on Twitter. I work at 7 West Media in Perth, as I mentioned. So that's 7news.com.au, the West Perth now all of those things, and like probably a lot of you, I have to commute to work. So this is where my story sort of begins with this. I found the commute frustrating. Uh, there's sort of that constant starting and stopping. There's a lot of anger on the road, either people at me or me at them, right? We can all fall into that trap of getting kind of unreasonably annoyed in traffic. It's easy to get into that state. Uh, we blame outwards for the journey taking a little bit too long. There's so many signs to tell someone they've wronged you on the road and only sort of a few signs to say, sorry, my mistake. Uh, I've actually got a bit of a, a fun stat on that one, but stay tuned. But we want to get where we're going as fast as possible and everyone and everything is in the way of that. Uh, it was kind of boring, right? What was there to do in that time that I was commuting? And if you like me, I like to sort of disconnect between home and work or work and home, whichever order that's in, particularly now with a young child, right? There was something that I needed for my mental health in that time to have a gap between the two. And along with the start of a young family, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that, you start considering your impact, both sort of what you're doing and how it affects the greater community. So as I started looking into commuting and researching it, I found out that the average time per week that we all spend commuting is four and a half hours. Right? It's a lot of time. It increases our sitting. So we have already do a lot of sitting as developers or in the technology field. And it tends to add to our stress, uh, which we know is bad for our health. So by driving, we're more likely to have health issues, be psychologically distressed, and sleep poorly. And so I've now done a bit of research and I'm now falling into the stressed category because I'm thinking, well, this isn't very good for my health, what I'm doing. So with all that information, I thought to myself, well, why not start looking at the possibilities I have with driving, what's available and how they impact my day. Uh, typically, we look at time and money, but I wanted to go a little bit beyond that and see what else, what other sort of factors were important to me. And that's where my test was born. Transport Driven Development, or TDD for short, which, <laughs> uh, that's not taken, so that's fine. <laughs> now, as developers or people in the tech field, we tend to be fairly pragmatic in our thinking. Uh, we research options. So say you've got a new project starting, 
you're going to have a look at all the different frameworks and how they might best suit the project that you're working on. Or even in your own time, you're looking at projects. We've heard of a whole bunch of new stuff at this conference today that's probably already on your list of things to go back to and, and have a look at. Um, so I wanted to apply that same thinking to my commute. So I'll quickly break that down. There's my commute is about 16 kilometres. That's give or take the pathway that I go when I'm doing it. And there's many different ways I could achieve this journey. This guy is what we call a personality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you have to be from Perth. But he rides his unicycle to work. You'll often see him going along the bike. Now, you must be living your best life if a unicycle is a viable option for you to get to work. <laughs> Closer to home, for probably a lot of you, is Sydney. I came across this chap that got so sick of the traffic and congestion that he opted to swim across the harbour to do that. Now, that seems incredibly dangerous to me, but if you are so angry at driving that this is the better option... So I thought, can I swim to work? <laughs> no, basically, but... <laughs> <laughs> I measured it on Google Maps because that was as far as I got. There was two kilometres across and I don't think I could make it, right? I'm not sure that I could do it. So I cut out unicycling and swimming and I'm not going to go through all of the options. Instead, <laughs> I focused on transport options that are readily available to me now and that was driving, public transport and cycling. So with that decided, how could I look at the results? The simplest way for me was using the watch and the phone and that allowed me to do, say, uh, my commute time, how much time I spent exercising, standing, calories burnt, heart rate, all sorts of little things like that. And I took all of that and put it into a spreadsheet and that's how I was going to get my results at the end of the test. Now with any good test, when we're doing that, there's rules. Right? So I would, with timing, I would start it when I left my front door and stop it when I arrived at the door of the office. That's sort of trying to get some consistency with very different styles of transport. When or if I could use my phone, uh, phone, I only have one, uh, I was going to not use infinite scrolling apps. So think Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. And that's not a judgment on those apps. I, I certainly hatched a lot of Pokemon eggs when I was walking to work. It's just that I wanted to see what else I could achieve in that time that I had away from those. And the third rule, and probably the most important one for me, was no work during that time. I'm going to talk a little bit about planning uh, later on, which kind of skirts close to that rule. But I don't want to increase the time of the thing that I'm already commuting to, right? And so, if you're like me, sometimes there's that trouble of disconnecting between work at times, right? We tend to do it all the time. So that's why I considered that one an important rule. So that's the transport, recording and all of that. Let's quickly look at how the day would work with each of the options. With the car, I sort of discussed this. I got up, get ready, jumped in the car, drove to work. There's nothing particularly exciting, and then the same on the way home. With public transport, it was a walk, a bus, another train, and then depending how I was feeling in the morning, either another walk and a, or a bus to get to work. Third, cycling. So the routine changed a little bit here. I would get up, have some sort of exercise gear, jump on, go to work, and get changed and ready at work. We luckily have those facilities. Now, I'm going to admit this early. I cheated in the cycling test. <laughs> I used an electric bike. Now, no, no, I know, I'm sorry. Um, hear me out though, e even though it does have a motor and is electric, you still have to pedal, right? You can't get away with not pedaling while you're using them. The engine won't work. Uh, so that means I'm still getting some health gains out of that, and we'll see that in a little bit. It just made life easier because I, don't, I didn't want to have to physically train in order to get to work. That's not how my thing works. And, and this body is not built for Lycra, right? So I wanted to not have to do that. So adding electricity is a really great way for getting into cycling without sort of being a sweaty mess by the time you arrive at work. I could wear sort of normal clothes. So let's instead of call it cheat, we will call it smart cycling, right? <laughs> so <laughs> with that admission and rundown of the rules and methodology, let's sort of get into the first of the criteria, and that is time. This is the one that a lot of us look at and hold in quite high importance. 
we mostly want to be done with this as fast as possible, as I mentioned. Uh, average weekly commute, as I mentioned in the introduction, is four and a half hours. And so we can see, though, that those times are actually increasing. For you here that live in Sydney, it's 71 minutes is the average per day spent commuting. And that is up from 61 minutes in 2002. Now, Perth, we used to be 59 minutes in 2002. We're up to 61. So we're not increasing quite as much, but over this side of the world, it's a bit more. So over the duration of the test, these are the averages that I got. And this is per journey. So per journey is home to work. That counts as a journey, right? The car is 21 minutes per journey, public transport 43, and cycling 44 minutes per each time. So purely looking at time, you would consider the car to be the winner in that scenario. I do have an asterisk next to it. I leave very early to work. I leave at 6.30. I did do the test during what we at least call peak hour, but I'm sure it's the same. And it was closer to 38 minutes, but I hated it. So I only did it once because I was late to work and late home. But uh, you have to sort of try it, right, to see. And, and that sort of makes the other two not look quite so bad. But with the data that I have, we would call car the winner in this category. Next is cost, right? How is your hip pocket affected? Uh, there's a few ways we could calculate this, but. Uh, I was finding it a bit tricky to get a solid number. So this, not to rag on the ABC, but this is one that they did. And they were comparing uh, public, uh, train and driving. And they were just looking at fuel cost and train fare. And I thought, oh, OK, the car sort of comes out on top here. But I started to think more, well, I don't have to buy a train. I don't have to register a train. I don't have to pay to park it. So I started to look a little bit more and think about that. Well, do you count the cost of the car? fuel, registration, insurance, maintenance, parking, all of that stuff starts to add up. And I found sort of someone that had done some looking into this. For Sydney, $14,000 a year if you are driving to work as your primary means of commuting. And we're not talking fancy cars here either. It's a base model Corolla that's worth $28,000. So the cost of your commute almost exceeds half the value of the car in one year alone. That's that. And it's actually a little worse for you in Sydney. It's $14,051. <laughs> well, oh, I know, that tipped it over, didn't it? <laughs> in Perth, we are down at around 11000 We don't have toll roads and as many people. But the short of it, though, is it's a lot of money, right? So how much of your take-home pay is spent getting to work just to do what you do? So taking that number and dividing it by the number of days we work in a year for you here in Sydney, it's... $38 a day just to get to work. Perth, it's 30, but it's a bit of a moving target. Fuel costs and all that stuff change. The cost of per day on the train is $5.12, right? I don't have to pay for anything else. It's just that and that's it. It's done. How much does a bike cost? Well, it's kind of free. I looked at how much it costs to charge an electric bike, and it's about 10 cents each time you do it. It lasts a few days, depending on how liberal you are with the turbo button. Maintenance, <laughs> very liberal, by the way, is the answer to that. Um, maintenance, uh, insurance, the cost of the bike, and it's electric, so it's a little bit more, but not in the sort of carbon territory. It's kind of in the middle there. So I roughly calculated it out using that same thing as $3 a day. So that's about the cheapest you can get, really. So it's, I, I consider it sort of a draw, but lean towards cycling, because you can have unexpected things, a flat tyre, insurance, any of someone can steal it, um, anything like that. So it's sort of a draw leading towards that. Now that's where most research and articles stop, time and money. But there's more to life though, right? Not everything revolves around time and money. So this is where I had a few different criteria that went a little bit beyond just me and sort of what I could find of uh, the joy in commuting. The first of that is free time, right? It often feels as though we don't have enough time to do everything that we want to do, right? I think everyone can feel that way. So I want to look at, well, what can I do with the time that I have? And with driving, it's, it's tricky, right? I can't knit. Uh, that, that would be tremendously dangerous. <laughs> I can't use my phone. We have laws against that here. But audio options are great. You have access to podcasts, music, audio books. All of those are really good. A colleague of mine told me that driving is her singing time. 
Now, I'm not going to be singing in the car, but I do sometimes enjoy seeing other people in the rear vision mirror sort of busting out their favourite songs. Right? That's a fun thing to see. Per for me, personally, I found podcasts to be the best option. Right? It gave me the best sort of information without distracting me too much from driving. Anything above that, and I would start to worry that I was going to smash into someone. If you're sort of programming, Syntax FM is a nice one, or if you're in a bit of a fun mood, Reply All, but you know, there's hundreds of them. There's no shortage of podcasts now. Uh, but you are kind of limited to what you can set up before you get going. I think the big trick with public transport is it's the ultimate in free time. And this is when I think people miss it. You don't have to concentrate on where anything is going. Uh, you just have to make sure that you can get off at the right stop, which I've definitely not missed it before and had to come back. Now, I mentioned earlier that an area of frustration with me is driving was not being able to disconnect from the day. I'd be at work and then home and there wasn't that clear gap. If I'd had a difficult day at work, say, then unfortunately that mood can translate into the home and that's not fair on those people. So how could I sort of overcome this in public transport? I've probably mentioned my childhood a few, a few times at this point. So when she was first growing up, like all sort of, oh, sorry, when we found out she was on the way, rather, like most parents, you try and sort of figure out, well, how can I make this child save the world and go to university and all of those things? And eventually you kind of get over that. But there was something that stuck with me in all of that research, which was teaching her sign language, specifically Auslan or Australian sign language in this case. Now. It varies when they can start speaking, anywhere from like, I don't know, 18 months or something onwards. But the theory, and in, in our case, the uh, fact of it is that when you teach them some sign language, they are able to communicate with you a lot earlier and they don't have ta as many tantrums. So words such as food or water, she could then sign back to us. Now, if you'll indulge me, because I think it's cute, this is baby Lara and she's signing for milk here, right? It's quite clear, at least once you know what she's, and she's pretty chuffed about this. <laughs> now, this was around nine months old. She couldn't effectively verbally communicate with us and for another like 10, 11 odd months. But anywho, that's not the point. It takes time to practice and learn something like sign language. Now, this is what I would spend my time on the train doing. Admittedly, it looked a little bit weird when you're doing this sort of stuff, <laughs> but, and then I would go home and I would sort of try and teach them to Lara later. But you're not limited, of course, to sign language, right? There's so many things that we've been picking up and looking at at this conference that you're thinking, how am I going to have the time to absorb all of this information? Well, there's a bit of time there. That's sort of the beauty of free time without responsibility. You can get in and learn something. And likely a lot of us have, you know, articles saved for later that we're going to get to. This is when you can do that, right? I think someone at the front has like a thousand or something in pocket last time. Not shaming, but she's over there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but apps like Khan Academy, Duolingo, whatever, right? I remember hearing a story, and it was a little while ago now, but Sydney-based uh, developer Dmitry Baranovsky, he ended up, I think, employed at Adobe partly because of a project he was working on while commuting on the trains here in Sydney. It was Raphael JS an SVG library and that spawned into Snap or something along that line. It's been a little while now, but that's the time that you have. Now, this is where I skirt a little bit close to work, but it's not, right? The other activity I would start the day is just planning my day. Now, for me, that was Todoist, uh, but there's many things you can do and it was just about outlining your day. It gives me an idea of what's coming up and anything I need to focus on. So that could be boring stuff like emails, but I might need to really catch up with someone or a project that's due, anything like that. Now, uh, the important part though, once it's planned and out in whatever medium you sort of want to do, you don't do any of it, right? Not yet, particularly email. Email's always that sneaky one that gets into your day much before you're sort of doing it. So yeah, it's really just getting it out of your head and onto the page. And I started to make another addition to this process. This is Kylie Timpani. She presented over in Perth on helping yourself while helping others. And the idea of her talk was sometimes we'll agree to lots of things, but you have to remember to keep time to yourself. The YouTube link is there if you're interested. There's a really great decision tree in that talk that can sort of help you work through some of that stuff. 
But there was something else I took from that talk. And Kylie talked about how she would block out her calendar for the day. And I, start, I couldn't do it for the whole week like Kylie did. I would do it each morning on the train as I was heading to work. And it was the mundane things like work and commute. But a lot of us want to do family time or project time. And it can be hard to figure out when we have time to do that. So I would just start to block them out in my day. And it gave me the opportunity to really have space for them. So I recommend Kylie's talk, if you can. It's underneath there. And with all the extra time on the train, you'll have plenty of time to do that. Now, cycling, it's similar to driving, right? I can't read a book, I can't knit. Uh, I, the guy in the unicycle, he might be able to, right? He's got yeah. free hands, but you do have to concentrate. Not as much as driving, there tends to be less traffic and less people, but it limits you to audio-based options as well. Podcasts and music were a favourite of mine. I just chuck my headphones on and sort of go through the journey. But there was another great aspect of cycling that I started to notice, and you can change directions or just stop really easily while you're cycling. That's hard to do with a car. So you don't have many time restrictions on the way home. And I've helped a lady chase down her runaway dogs. Or I've stopped in at a cafe just because I wanted to. I started to see more of what was in my community by being on the bike. I was like, oh, I'll try this place and stop and do that. Now, Usually bike parking is free. It's usually at the front of the place. And if it's not at the front of the place, a sturdy pole will do. So it's really easy to stop and kind of do something like that. So with all of that, closing out personal time, I love the free time that I started to get from the train. Um, I've done heaps of activities, caught up on all those articles that I had saved for later. Mostly because I don't have to concentrate or steer. You're just there on the journey to read, learn, explore. And so that's why I sort of lean to uh, public transport in this part of the test. Now, health. I, I alluded to this at the start. We spend a lot of time sitting down. Uh, we know the negatives of this, right? So we had standing desks for a little while, and then we found out we can't stand for too long. So the next criteria, what health benefits could I get from each of these forms of transport? The Australian recommendations has 150 to 300 minutes of moderate exercise. Moderate meaning, say, walking, something like that. Or, if you're feeling active, 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous exercise. So that could be cycling, uh, team sports, anything along that line. But if you, if you think about that in your work week, it's about an hour a day. Now, we've discussed being time poor. Uh, exercise is one of those important activities that tends to slip pretty quickly, right? Yeah. Let me know if any of these sound familiar. I'll definitely get back into this in the new year. I'll just finish this project first. And these are other great excuses that I've made to myself. Um, personally, I find it difficult to exercise after work. I get home, I sit down, I'm like, whew, tough day on the keyboard. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just rest for a bit, and then I will definitely exercise. Now, <laughs> of course I don't, right? It doesn't end up happening. So looking at this, as usual, we'll start with driving. 47 kilojoules burnt driving, zero hours or minutes of exercise. My heart rate was 69 to 89 beats per minute. Now, the higher end of that is more stress. Like, it's not a good heart rate. I'm not like, oh, yeah, I'm getting into this driving. I'm like, oh, you cut me off. Yeah, but, uh. <laughs> um, <laughs> public transport, slightly better, particularly if you add that walk in there that I was talking about. The kilojoules burnt, 348. 15 odd minutes of exercise, 64 to 88. The higher end here being walking. It's a healthier heart rate. Now, I'm sure we guessed who was going to be the winner here. And even though I admitted to cheap, uh, sorry, smart cycling, <laughs> this is the part of the results are still really interesting, because remember, I do still have to pedal to do it. So I burnt 1,981 kilojoules of energy, 44 minutes. So this is per journey again, by the way. 44 minutes of exercise, 93 to 133 beats per minute. I don't know if that's too high, but I'm, I'm cool with it. I'm still here. I seem to be OK. It was about that high just before getting on stage, too. So things seem OK. Now, that's a massive increase over the other options. And you've definitely met the Australian guidelines at this point, um, probably the vigorous ones, I would say. But personally, I find kilojoules a bit of a confusing metric. Like, what does that mean? So instead, I like to relate it to delicious snacks, right? Because 
that is relatable. So if you've met me before or probably seen me at this conference, I'm a bit of a fan of donuts. Now, I know they're not very good for me, that's not the point, but how many am I allowed to eat with each of these options? I'm glad none of you asked. <laughs> with driving, oh, sorry, let's take a basic cinnamon donut, right, naturally. With driving, I can have 7% of one donut. With public transport, I can have 60% of one donut. Now, I don't know about any of you, I don't have that level of self-control. <laughs> so, with cycling, I can have three and a bit donuts. Now, two is probably fine for me, right? But I like that I've got one as backup. <laughs> we all have those days. So that's why cycling takes out this section of the test, which was a great sort of boost in my physical health. Now, closely related to physical health is our mental health. Uh, I sort of talked about my desire to disconnect from the day, home and office. If you're having a stressful morning where some tiny person's shoes have once again gone missing into the black hole that children's shoes goes into, you don't want to then get into work and like be blaming someone for shoes gone missing, right? That, and we all just have stuff going on in our lives, right? And it, it can be beneficial to take some time out and look after you. So what benefits could I get from my mental health and well-being from each of these options? couldn't really find it with driving. Um, I felt the same stress and frustration that inspired me to do this test in the first place. There's a lot of rudeness and anger on our roads. Now, Perth, we're, we're famous for being terrible at merging. Um, it's more about how you can get ahead of someone rather than making the system work for everybody. Now, I'm sure Sydney has some variation of that that you can all know when you've been driving. So it's dis difficult to disconnect. But I got to add a new column to my spreadsheet at this point in time. <laughs> How many times I was flipped off. It was, th it was three. Three times. Now, nothing brings the joy in your day like someone telling you where to go. So I don't, <laughs> I don't have a grade for driving because I couldn't find that space. But what could I do with public transport? At the start of my trip home, I would do some mindfulness exercises. So for me, that meant opening up an application called Buddhify, but there's plenty of others available, Calm, Oak, you can find them. And the first 10 minutes was spent focusing on sort of breathing and calming that inner voice. I was giving this a go. So that would always make me feel a little bit more relaxed. Now, I know it's the end of the day. Some of us had a very late night, but let's give something a go here. The, it's been a stressful long day. So if you can, start to sort of follow along with the breathing exercise in this GIF. You should sort of start to be having longer breaths, calmer, and being a little bit more relaxed. And it's just kind of something that even now, like as someone speaking, I can start to reduce my heart rate a little bit because it's, there's some stress in standing up on a podium like this, but even in the audience. Now, imagine a long day at work. There's always some stress here and there. Extrapolate all of that by 10 minutes, right? Now, how much better are you going to be feeling at the end of your day in your commute doing something like that rather than being stressed out? Especially, say, when I have a young child at home who's super pumped to see you, right? If you finish the day tired and arrive home tired, it can be a very long afternoon for you. So I really appreciated this time. Now, cycling, we covered physical health just before, but it's important to sort of do the direct link between physical health and mental health and how that can prove, right? Act, belong, commit. Now, you can actually use mindfulness apps while you're cycling as well. It's called active uh, meditation. Now, you look at your breathing and how your muscles are feeling and how heavy you're breathing. Oh, God, <laughs> I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> There's a surprising finding for me, though, outside of that, with cycling and a little bit public transport, is this is where solutions would start to appear for me. So you know when you're, I don't know, laying in bed at 3 a.m. or in the shower or whatever, and all of a sudden the solution to your coding problem appears. Oh, I need to add a semicolon or whatever, <laughs> whatever it may be, right? <laughs> this is where they would start to appear for me. And they, cycling and public transport gave my brain time to process solutions in the background because I'm not having to actively worry about what's happening around me. 
That's where the idea for this talk started to come to be. Is that technically mental health? Well, I would argue yes, right? If you've ever been really stuck on a problem, we know how stressful that can be as developers. I should know this. You start to doubt yourself, all of that stuff. So having time to process between something, just my brain can just work on it in the background. And that opened up a lot of mental capacity for me in the evenings, and I appreciated that. So who wins here? Well, not getting flipped off, but <laughs> sort of leaning towards cycling and public transport. Both had a really good option for me. I really appreciated the mindfulness exercises, but I also appreciated that time to process. Tangentially related to mental health, but I also observed the view of my journey. Now, I mentioned Perth is really good at merging. <laughs> the lines apparently mean nothing. <laughs> and then these people are going around the outside because they're more important. And then they all dive in over there, right? And it's just, this is a particularly famous road for us. But the view is red lights, weird bumper stickers, people flipping you off. It's not great. Now, public transport, well, it's OK. It's the inside of a carriage in Perth. You can look out the window. Sometimes you'll see cars. Sometimes you'll see the river. Sometimes you've got someone's armpit in your face. It's a lucky draw, right? You don't really know what you're going to get. Compare this to cycling. This is an actual part that I sort of cycle along. You can see our version of a skyline in the background. This is called Lake Munger in Western Australia. Now, I'm not going out of my way to reach this. I'm not riding out into the hills to kind of have a light, nice view. This is actually right next to the freeway. It's just blocked off by trees. And it's just better, right? If you compare the two side by side, how much nicer is the view in cycling versus the view in driving? How much more calm and relaxed would you be in the other one? So that the winner of this criteria for me is cycling. Now, I didn't have a measurable way of sort of checking the environment that I was doing this. Um, but it's, I think it's an important area to touch on at the very least. We know petrol cars aren't great. In Australia, our transportation is the second largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. We emitted about 102 million tonnes of carbon dioxide in 2018. That is including air travel and a few other things. So we're a fairly wealthy country, right, arguably. You might be wondering where we sit in the global rankings. We are 20th. We have less restrictions on transport pollution. We're a country mostly in love with cars. If you're interested in the top three, it's France, India, and Italy, so kudos to them. Down with us is Turkey, South Africa, and Thailand. So everything is spread out because of our size. Combine this with our relatively low spend on public transport and alternative transport infrastructure, and this is why you quickly find yourself down here in 20th. It's estimated those carbon sort of emissions will be at about 111 million tonnes by 2030. So we love cars, but we do not utilise them very well. 95% of the time, cars are parked doing nothing. Right? They're just sitting there. And there's substantial infrastructure to support parked cars. Estimates put that infrastructure at about 30,000 square kilometres in Europe or 27,000 square kilometres in America. If you sort of put that all together, it's the size of Belgium. If you've paved over Belgium, sorry if you're from Belgium, and put all of the parking there, that is the size of that. And that's, sorry, that's just Europe, right? Not both of them together. That's just the 30,000 square kilometres of Europe. It's often valuable land, right in the middle of cities, land that could be used for anything, right? Parks, public spaces, housing. Often cars have better uh, infrastructure than what people do, or some people at least. So what could we recreate, oh, sorry, what could we create by taking that space back? So we know public transport and cycling are low emission, but an interesting stat I found is if you cycle each way to work, 10 kilometres, sorry, each way to work, you alone for a year, you alone reduce your carbon emissions by 1,500 kilograms. So that's like a direct impact that you can have. Not to mention the sort of flow and effect of taking more cars off the road and thus less sort of traffic and emissions that way. So if this is an important criteria for you, then public transport and cycling are your best option there. If, uh, the next criteria I wanted to look at was safety. Now, any form of transport has an element of risk, but I was curious to see what those numbers were. We have become a little bit distracted, focused on our phones more than where we're going. Well, we're tired, have something on your mind, we can all relate to that. 
or through no fault of our own, something can just go wrong. Whatever the case may be, if you're familiar with Kev C. Dodds, he's somewhat well, fairly well known in sort of the web React community. He tweeted out this sobering fact that 3,000 people a day die in car-related accidents. One of them was his brother. Now, that's globally, right? We do a little bit better here in Australia. Current averages are 1,137 a year, 930 of those in cars, so anyone in the car. 35 of those are cyclists. Now, remember, we have a lot less cyclists, so relatively speaking, if you did that, it's, it's high for cyclists as well. 176, just unlucky to be in the area. Just before I came here, I was walking along St George's Terrace, which is one of our main streets. A car ploughed straight into a light post, kind of where I was standing. Right? You can just be in the wrong spot. Any number above zero is sad, but we are improving. In 1970, that was our road toll, 3,798. So we've almost, or we've more than halved it now. But not because we're getting better at driving, right? We can't sit there and go, oh, we've, we've improved. Because technology is better at protecting us. We have higher safety standards, but I think the way we can get this down to zero is through more automation. So much of what cars do now is becoming automated. I don't have to turn my lights on or windscreen wipers, even the temperature in the car, I don't control that. But you know what I do control? Speed and direction. Now that doesn't seem like a very good idea. The sooner they can be taken out of my hands, the better. So I'm not gonna pick a winner here. There is no real winner. I think when you're on the roads, you just have to be a little bit more patient and understanding. There's kind of an unnecessary war between cyclists and you. When did you first find it in France? No idea, I actually couldn't find it, but good question. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I don't wanna pick in a, in a sensitive area, essentially, right? Because with those results and that time, it's a, it's a sensitive area for some people, but uh, blah, 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 what was I saying? That's no, fine, I'll get back on track. Um, I, wish I, I wish I could actually think of what I was saying and not just stupid puns. Um, but look, there's an unnecessary war between sort of cyclists and drivers now. And if you are stuck behind a slow bike or a slow car, just bust out your, your favorite tunes and sing along, right? So let's wrap up the findings of this test. Uh, driving is the fastest option, kind of, if you leave early. It is really expensive though, when you look at how much of that goes towards that. And you're limited to what you can achieve. Uh, as I mentioned, the average cost for you guys, $14,051. It didn't, and it also didn't match any of my other criteria. And I was flipped off three times. I'm definitely not holding a grudge. Public transport, it's cheap, it's safe, right? Safe being a relative term. Safe for someone that looks like me and am who I am. But I am also talking about during peak hour time. So decide what safe means for you. I don't want to kind of push that on anyone. The free time was amazing. You'll have time to break between work and home, learn something new. For me, that was Auslan, but for you, that can be whatever interests you. Uh, meditate, mindfulness, exercise, enjoy your own company for a while, but the scheduling can be a little bit tricky. Cycling, well, you've well and truly met your daily exercise goals at this point in time. It's relatively cheap. This is where your ideas and programming, all of your solutions will come. Uh, maybe not all, but you know, they will start to process and things, but it is the slowest option. So I've run through a bit of an analytical and emotional look at my public transport. So you might be wondering, well, what do I do now? I've highlighted areas and ways that I sort of improve my journey and ways that I could maybe further improve that. But it's a mixture, right? Like all things, particularly in programming, there is no one solution that's perfect. Uh, I'm gonna continue primarily with cycling and public transport. They met the most of my criteria and were beneficial both for me and the community. I still drive on occasion, that's unavoidable. We're a big country, the weather might force my hand, I might have to pick up my daughter, I might be sick, but it's gonna be my last option. I'm happier, healthier, and more engaged in sort of mind and body because of changing my primary commute. And it's difficult to let that go for the sake of 20 minutes, right? So since changing that primary commute, I have averaged putting fuel in my car once every two months, and I'm starting to stretch that out a little bit further. Now, if you know the price of fuel, that's a massive saving. 
a bit of a sort of personal goal, I reached a thousand kilometers on my bike recently. As someone who never really cycled before then, that was a nice achievement for me. It does say turbo, but don't judge that. I still <laughs> rode a thousand kilometers, right? I mentioned I used liberal use of that, but... <laughs> so working in tech, we're in a strong position to define the future of transport. We know that adding more lanes to roads doesn't work. Whatever lane you add, you get exactly that amount of traffic in less than a year, like more traffic. This phenomenon is called induced demand, with an increased supply of something makes people want it more, right? It's like me with the donut. The more there are, the more that I want to eat. <laughs> Governments, they sometimes like that short-term solution, though. Not building those roads could mean better infrastructure for alternative forward-thinking methods. I know out the front of here, I've lost my directions, but I noticed out the front of here, Sydney has started to put their trams back. Right? Perth used to have trams and then we took them away and now we're all regretting it, except for Melbourne. <laughs> so in the sh anyone from Melbourne here is like, yes. <laughs> in the short term, we need to advocate getting more trains, light rail and other public transport options, plus an addition of cycling infrastructure. Change up that settings. If you do find yourself using your vehicle less, you can start look at renting your car out. We can start to form little communities of cars rather than every person owning one. Remember, they're parked 95% of the time doing nothing. You can earn a little bit of money from your car. Electric vehicles offer a great, great way to cut down on your emissions uh, and costs as well. Governments are willing to subsidize the costs of the car, of charging, even parking can be free when you have an electric vehicle. Automation, I think, is a really exciting area, a great space for any of us that are in tech to start to get involved. We saw how many road deaths are in the world, and I think the way of reducing that down as much as we can is by taking the responsibility away from us. There's little we control now, except the most dangerous aspects of a car. Uh, I love the idea of, say, having a car subscription service. The car comes to my house, picks me up, drops me off at work, and with other people, I'm social, and then it can go off and do other things for the day. There's no reason I need to keep it. I could then, say, turn my garage into a board game room. It'll probably get taken over by my daughter, but I can dream about having a board game room, right? There's Hyperloop. If you ever worked in Woolies and they had those tubes and you would put that thing in there and it would go boom and shoot off and you thought, I wonder what it would be like to be in that tube. <laughs> That's what Hyperloop is. <laughs> I may be under, so I don't actually understand the technology, but I love the visual <laughs> of shooting through that. And I definitely had those thoughts before back when I worked, and maybe I'm showing my age. Maybe teleportation will one day exist. <laughs> All right, that, that one might be a pipe dream, but I'm going to continue to have that dream, right? Whatever the future holds, if you are in tech, you can encourage it. Help foster its growth by getting involved in these various things, challenging yourself to try the alternatives that I've run through a bit today. You'll be happier you did, healthier when you do, and cashed up when you're no longer driving. So I'd love to hear if anyone does, in fact, give this a try. And with that in mind, here are some tips that I found help me sort of after this test that I can sort of pass on. So with public transport, change where you leave. I have a bus stop directly out the front of my house. If I go to that one, I've got one chance every 30 minutes to get a bus, remembering this is in Perth. If I walk 200 metres down the road, I have four chances every 30 minutes to get a bus. And I've had that little bit of a walk, got my heart going in the morning. GPS tracking. We, I don't, I'm not sure, you might already have this in Sydney, but in Perth, we've just added GPS tracking to our buses. So you can play this really fun sort of Indiana Jane, Jones style game where you track it on your phone and then run out your front door and see if you can get straight onto the bus as it's pulling up. But it removes that friction point that a lot of us have with a bus, like when is it coming? So you can see exactly when it's coming and even that is usually enough to get people interested in it. JavaScript. Right? <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> think of public transport like uh, the JavaScript event loop. Now, that's just my area of programming. But as programmers, we are often used to making our stuff work in a defined space, in a system that is always moving. Now, 
people kind of expect public transport to be there exactly when they get there. We don't sort of expect that in programming. We know to work it in such a way that it's going to work in its best way. We don't interrupt that cycle. Public transport works in a cycle. If you can figure that system out, like we do with any new languages or frameworks, you will find a much happier time dealing with public transport. Start small with cycling. I mentioned I didn't want to physically train to get to work. Do one or two days a week and see where you can increase from there. Get an electric bike. Oh, sorry. Jeez. Right? Go electric. Get an electric bike, scooter or equivalent. Um, encourage your work to create facilities that support you getting to work in other ways. If you need a really good argument for sort of your work creating these facilities, People who cycle to work are half as likely to take sick leave as those that don't. And the further and faster that those people cycle, the less likely they are to take sick leave. I don't know what speed has to do with it, but apparently it does. Most importantly, have fun with it. Don't solely focus on time. Focus on how you're feeling and what you're getting out of it. If you're thinking to yourself, well, that, but that's still a lot longer than my current commute now, let me sort of phrase, look at it another way. If you do exercise now, let's just say you go to the gym, you'll commute to work, you'll do work, you'll travel to the gym, you'll do, say, the gym for an hour, then you have to travel from there to home. All up, you've added a lot of time. If you condensed all of that into cycling, say, to and from work, suddenly that 44 minutes doesn't look quite so bad because you've managed to cut something else out of your day. Or do both, right? You're going to be pretty fit at that point. Uh, and oh, the other thing, now you're at work, you're definitely going to ride home because you are now trapped. <laughs> right? And there's nothing as motivating as being trapped to do something, right? It is a motivating factor. I have to do this because I am here now. Uh, oh, that, that was, sorry, that was the other thing that can you'll be so awake by the time you get to work that you also might not need coffee anymore, right? You'll save a little bit of money there. So here's my challenge to you all here today. I know it's the last talk and it's been a long conference, but give this a try. See what you can improve in your commute. Add fun, excitement, health benefits to your journey. Put down infinite scrolling apps and take the ideas from this and see if there's anything that sparks an interest or a joy in your commute. Do use infinite scrolling apps. I'm not here to judge, right? Whatever makes it fun for you. But most of all, find the joy in your journey. If you're interested in the resources that I use, they're here on the screen now, but my Twitter handle is there, and I'm also happy to share any of that information with you. But otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs> so we have time four questions, if anyone has some. Yo. So, uh, you said that it was like $14,000 a year to have a car and commute. Yeah. Does that, does that just assume that you're just using the car for commuting and not for, you know, like grocery or you know, any other sort of daily needs? Uh, half and half. So obviously the cost of the car is factored into that. And it also assumed that you had a um, loan on the car as well, right? So there's an increase in cost there. But then they... From that point, it was just looking at the cost of getting to and from parking, all of those things. So your, your situation is definitely going to be unique in any of these, but gr great question, right? Some people need one regardless. Um, but it, it did look at it at the cost of at least having one, but then it, it forked from there. I think I saw another hand up somewhere. Yep. Oh, okay. Like everyone expected. Yeah. And so it is like you actually walk, but then at the speed you're using, the, the worst part of the car trip is like the price of food. Yeah. So and you're so stressed that you're on turbo <laughs> that you're just like, I've got to concentrate because if I crash, that's going to be embarrassing. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. Have you thought about motorbiking? Uh, I, I kind of... <laughs> I, I go back to the safety <laughs> aspect there. Now, I, I don't have anything against however you get to work. I, I think about it from my own skill and ability as a person. And, 
And I can think of several times where I've lost concentration driving. Like I said, I sometimes got to work and could not tell you what happened on that journey. I just kind of made it. And then I apply that to a bike and I think, I would be stuffed. Like, and that, that might just be my level of concentration, right? I'm easily distracted at times. But I, and I have a young child now, right? You start to think of like your own mortality. And so for me, I, I just didn't go down that route because it, it scared me, right? Like I, it's not the thing that I want to do. Um, I, I understand that I can go through. Interestingly, right, we've had a, a spate of incidents in Perth recently. And one of them was a motor motorcyclists, yeah, I guess that's the term. It ended very differently for them than it did for the car. And so I just, I stay away from that stuff. But I'd be super interested in hearing the results and everything from someone that does do that um, and how it would compare. I mean, Sydney is going to be very different from Perth, right? And so more people could collate this sort of information on how they're finding their, what's working for them and other ways that they could improve this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's open plan office. Could you say to your members and colleagues, I'm not interested in being in the boat office and the shipping works department, is that true? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So could you please tell the chain or the bus to do that and <laughs> could be factoring and stuff and just put that on email? I, I mean, you might be able to. I'm, I'm a bit of a creature of habit. If my monitor's moved a degree, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Something's changed. I can't possibly program under these conditions. Um, <laughs> prima donna. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a creature of habit. I, I have my space, and this is why I'm actually not a big remote worker, ironically. I know it's the dream, but I like going to work because I'm away from my home. There's nothing wrong with my home. I, I live a nice life. Um, but I like to be in that space. That's my workspace. That's my home space. And that's just how my brain works. Cool. Well, I don't actually think there's anything more. Do I close NDC? Is that, <laughs> is that how it works? Was I the lock note? This is exciting. First time NDC, first time closing. Thank you, I guess. Thanks very much for coming along.